It is my absolute pleasure to introduce to you tonight Sarah Stock. Uh, we've been trying to get Sarah here to speak for um, the last couple of years, and she finally said yes. So we're really excited to have her here. Um, she is the wildlife ecologist for Yosemite. She has been overseeing Yosemite's program for land animal biodiversity since 2006. She studies wildlife ranging from songbird population dynamics to bighorn sheep to the ecology of bats. She earned her graduate degree at the University of Idaho with a research focus on the migration ecology of forest owls. Before moving to Yosemite Valley with her family, she studied birds in locations ranging from Alaska to the South Pacific Islands. And in Sarah's free time, she enjoys birding, climbing, and naturalizing, like many of us here. So it's my pleasure to welcome you, Sarah. <laughs> well, good evening, everyone. And thank you for making the effort to be here. It is my pleasure to tell you the story of three very inspiring animals. The bighorn sheep, the peregrine falcon, and the red fox. So what do these three species have in common? All three of these species disappeared from Yosemite, and now they're back. Yay! Yay! <laughs> Thank you for that. That is worth a cheer. The bighorn sheep was gone from Yosemite for about 70 years, and the peregrine was not breeding for about 35 years, and the red fox was gone for almost 100 years. Tonight, I'm going to tell you these stories, how these charismatic species disappeared from Yosemite, a protected area, and how they are now They've now reappeared, and what we're doing to keep them from disappearing again. So I'm going to start with the Sierra Nevada bighorn sheep. This talk is in chunks. So the first chunk is the bighorn sheep, and then I'll go to peregrines, and then finish with red fox. So when I talk about Sierra Nevada bighorn sheep, I'm talking about a sheep that is found nowhere else in the world. This is a distinct subspecies. There are three subspecies. The Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep is the most widespread of all, and they can be found from the, in the high peaks of the in, inner mountain west from Canada all the way to parts of Arizona. Desert bighorn are, while, big, Rocky, while the Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep and Sierra, Sierra Nevada bighorn sheep are adapted to high elevation and alpine conditions. The desert bighorn sheep is adapted to hot and cold conditions, but in more desert landscapes. So I'm gonna be focusing on the Sierra Nevada bighorn sheep. And Yosemite has only one federally endangered species. And this is it. And the species lived in Yosemite for thousands of years, and then about 100 years ago, they virtually disappeared from the Yosemite landscape. When Yosemite lost the Sierra Nevada bighorn sheep, it lost its wilderness icon. And since this is a talk about Yosemite, it's time for a John Muir quote. <laughs> John Muir admired the Sierra Nevada bighorn sheep. However, he somewhat naively wrote, Man is the most dangerous enemy of all, but even from him, our brave mountain dweller has little to fear in the remote solitudes of the high Sierra. Little did John Muir know that the bighorn had already succumbed to the pressures of man, in particular to the diseases from their domesticated sheep, which John Muir himself reluctantly herded. Historically, bighorn sheep ranged throughout Yosemite's high country. This is a picture that was actually taken in Tuolumne Meadows. And each year, over 100,000 domestic sheep would graze. These domestic sheep carried fatal diseases. And it's pretty easy to imagine how the sheep could have wandered up, you know, into the, they're already in the high country, and how they could have encountered the native Sierra Nevada bighorn sheep that had no resistance to the fatal diseases that these domesticated sheep carried. And because of that, the native bighorns perished 
by the hundreds, and, in 19, and that led to the demise of the bighorn sheep from Yosemite. By 1914, bighorn sheep had disappeared from the park. Domestic sheep aren't allowed to graze in Yosemite any longer, and bighorn sheep are now protected under the Endangered Species Act. An important objective of recovery is to maintain enough bighorn sheep in the source herds to repopulate other areas within the bighorn's historical range. And this is what happened in Yosemite when a herd of bighorns were first reintroduced into Levine and Canyon on the park's eastern fringe in the 1980s, so starting in 1986. But in Yosemite's vast wilderness comprising the Cathedral Range, only the bones were left behind to remind us of the bighorn's presence. In 1933, a park ranger naturalist named Bert Harwell encountered this mummified bighorn sheep melting out of the Lyle Glacier. About four years ago, my family and I went on a backpacking trip to the glaciers. We wanted to see the glaciers before they were gone. When we were there, adjacent to the glacier, we found this ancient bighorn sheep skull. And we were struck by the fact that we can't bring these glaciers back but we can bring the bighorn sheep back. And so looking at that skull was like looking through a window from the past into the future. Now I'm gonna show a short video, um, 10 minutes, on the reintroduction of bighorn sheep into the cathedral range. majestic creatures and when you can watch them in their native habitat and their ability to move through that terrain is impressive. John Muir certainly referred to Sierra Bighorn as the bravest mountaineer. And I think that's an apt description of Bighorn, because if you've ever seen the kind of terrain that they're able to move in, and they move in it with such comfort and agility. They live on mountaintops. They'll sit out thunderstorms on a ridgetop like it's no big deal. They are wild, wild creatures, and they persist in the most rugged environment. They belong in the cliffs. They live in the cliffs, so that they should be in Yosemite. Well, with the arrival of Western settlers, domestic sheep came along with them, and domestic sheep carry diseases that can decimate bighorn populations. Bighorn sheep have no immunity to these pathogens. When they're exposed to it, you can lose entire herds. You know, there were probably millions of domestic sheep grazed throughout the Sierras starting in the late 1800s. By 1995, there were only about 100 bighorn sheep left in the Sierra. And Sierra Nevada bighorn sheep are a unique subspecies of bighorn sheep. They're the rarest mountain sheep in North America. This distinct subspecies is endangered because of its extremely low numbers and vulnerability to disease. So in order to recover the population in Yosemite, we really needed another herd in the center of Yosemite's wilderness, so it was buffered by threat from disease with domestic sheep. When you look at a lot of endangered species recovery efforts throughout the U.S., they are bleak. You know, they are on the decline. 
there's little hope for them to recover. And in many cases, that's because the habitat's lost. And without the habitat, you can't recover a species. And what's unique about this situation is that the habitat is still there. And a lot of it's wilderness, a lot of it's protected. We think that Yosemite offers some of the best summer habitat available in the Sierra. The Cathedral Range has a lot of high elevation alpine meadows that we think will be really important sources of nutrition for bighorn. So in order to give Sierra bighorn the best chance of persisting, we really need them to have a larger geographic range. And the fastest way to make that happen is to move them. Well, today we're in Yosemite National Park. We're in the upper Merced watershed. And right behind me are two metal crates. And inside the crates are Sierra Nevada bighorn sheep. These bighorn sheep have had quite a day today. This morning, they were down south in Sequoia National Park in the Mount Langley area. That herd had enough females to where we could remove these sheep from that herd and now reintroduce them back into Yosemite. It'll be the first time in over 100 years that we've had a bighorn sheep herd inhabit this area. It's always difficult to know, OK, is it OK to be excited yet? Because we open the boxes and turn the use out, and it couldn't have gone more smoothly. But I'm thinking, well, we don't have any ramps here yet. So you know, we need to get the ramps. So it was a time to celebrate, but we knew that we couldn't really celebrate until we got the rams in. For these reintroductions, where we're moving animals into historic habitat, we capture bighorn sheep using a helicopter and a net gun. We have the helicopter fly into an area and essentially try to find animals. And then they have to determine whether they think they can catch those animals. And with bighorn sheep, that's particularly challenging because they're in such steep, rugged terrain. They pursue a group of sheep and wait until they have a safe shot in safe terrain. And from the helicopter, they deploy a net from a net gun, which captures a bighorn sheep. Then the helicopter is able to immediately lower down right over the animal. One of the crew members jumps out on the animal. They put a blindfold and hobbles on the animal and then put them in a transport bag where the sheep are flown into a base camp for processing. The recovery effort has only been able to be successful by this huge collaborative effort with the National Park Service at Yosemite and Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks, Inyo National Forest, Humboldt Toyabe National Forest, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, my department, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, I think everybody believes in this project. The Yosemite Conservancy, the Sierra Nevada Bighorn Sheep Foundation, and the National Wild Sheep Foundation have all supported this project. I've seen us go from really being close to the verge of extinction, you know, where we were seriously talking about pulling animals out of the wild and starting a captive breeding effort. Now we're up to around 600 animals. say something about humans. We're capable of making mistakes, but we're also capable of correcting those mistakes. You know, it takes a lot of hard work, but it's the right thing to bring this animal back to its rightful place.
People are going to be able to see bighorn sheep in Yosemite. Folks go out hiking in the Cathedral Range and they really might see bighorn sheep, especially as the population grows. And I think that'll add a totally different experience for the visitor to the park. So I'm going to just um, put a call out to um, Steve Bumgarner, who is a videographer. He did a really, he's a very creative videographer. You could see the different angles. And I think that's, um, there's not very much footage of the actual capture. Um, and he did a really good job with that. So that video highlighted the reintroduction of Sierra Nevada bighorn sheep into Yosemite's Cathedral Range. And so I just want to kind of walk you through where we are today. So in that initial reintroduction, that was the 10 ewes, and then the two rams came later. And so the, uh, 12 sheep were initially reintroduced. And now today, we have every reason to believe that there are eight sheep in the cathedral herd. Um, we went into the winter with um, six ewes and two rams. And I guess one ram went over to Gibbs, so maybe that makes seven. <laughs> um, and two of those six ewes were born there in the cathedral range. So they are carrying that ancestral knowledge that they can then hopefully pass on to their offspring. And we're also hoping with that ram that spent the winter with them at the Parsons Plateau that we're gonna have new lambs. Um, and so it's just a matter of getting out there and um, finding them. Hopefully they're there. Um, and then as far as milestones, uh, NRU stands for the Northern Recovery Unit. Bighorn are, they have different recovery units throughout their range. Um, Yosemite is in that Northern Recovery Unit, and that includes the Cathedral Range as well as the Gibbs Herd and the Mount Warren Herd. And we reached our recovery goal in 2016. And when I say recovery goal, I mean what's in the recovery plan of 50 U's. And um, then we lost a little bit of ground with the winter of 2016 to 2017. Um, so we have some work to do to get it back up to that. And then also um, another milestone was that um, some of the, a couple of ranches in the Mono Basin um, were closed for, to, big, to um, domestic sheep grazing. And so that, that really reduced the risk of disease transmission. And that was something that a lot of people worked really hard to make happen for a long time. So to have that happen um, is really good. And now that there are more bighorns in Yosemite, we're, we now have more opportunities to see them. Um, it used to be that park employees were only vaguely aware that we even had bighorn sheep in Yosemite. In fact, I recall a conversation that I had with one of the upper managers, I won't say her name because it would embarrass her, but she um, was thinking we had mountain goats. <laughs> um, so, um, and that doesn't happen anymore. Um, the, the park's really proud of, of, you know, to have bighorn sheep, especially with the, re, you know, the reintroduction into the cathedral range. And people are sharing stories and they're really excited about um, seeing them and experiencing them. Okay, so now I'm gonna shift to the peregrine falcon, the fastest animal in the world with speeds clocked at over 200 miles per hour. So peregrines are extremely widespread. They're found on every continent except for Antarctica. And they're about the size of a falcon, uh, or sorry, they're a falcon that's about the size of a crow. The adults, um, top left, have a slaty, gray, um, bluish, um, bluish gray black back. <laughs> this one's a little brown. Sometimes there's a little bit of sexual dimorphism, whereas the females will be a little bit browner, but um, that's not always a good way to tell um, males from females. It's mostly size. Females are bigger than males. They have, the adults have that dark head that kind of looks like a helmet with the white cheek patch and the white throat. 
the adults have, um, they're really light on their breasts with that really fine barred, um, darkly barred breast. They have um, a yellow sear, which is at the base of the bill, and yellow feet, um, and then the tip of their bill is black along with their talons are black also. And they have that notch or hook on the end of their bill, and that's for severing the spinal column of their prey. And the juvenile is just more brown overall. Instead of the bars, they have really thick streaking, um, brown streaking on their breast. So, <laughs> so what happened to the peregrine falcon? Um, why did we lose their breeding population in the park? In the 1940s, peregrine populations underwent a steep decline due to the widespread use of the pesticide DDT. With over one billion pounds of DDT in the environment, the residue was inescapable and became concentrated in the peregrine's eggshells, causing them to collapse before the embryos had a chance to grow and develop. By the 1970s, peregrines were nearly eliminated from the eastern U.S. and were barely hanging on in the western U.S. Conservationists responded by speaking out, and DDT was outlawed in 1972, and the peregrine was listed as endangered in 1973. Following that listing in 1973, massive recovery efforts took place including the rearing and releasing of over 6,000 juvenile peregrine falcons into the wild. Yosemite, with its prime cliff habitat, was one of the focal areas for these reintroduction efforts. And rock climbers played a central role in those efforts, because they would, we needed rock climbers to access the nests. And then once they got to the nest sites, they would swap out the contaminated eggs with dummy eggs, and then later those dummy eggs with chicks that had been raised in captivity. So the contaminated, contaminated eggs, they would take back to the laboratory, test them for DDT, they would try to incubate them and hatch them, and when they could, then they would return those chicks back to the nest. But the parent would, regardless if it was you know, her and his, they raised their kids together, <laughs> um, regardless if it was their chicks or not, they would raise them. These efforts paid off because in 1978, rock climbers scaling the face of El Capitan discovered an active peregrine falcon nest. And this was the first time in almost 40 years that breeding was confirmed in all of the Sierra Nevada. And this was the first known nesting in the Sierra at that time. After extensive recovery efforts, peregrine falcons have made a remarkable comeback. In Yosemite, we no longer need to manipulate them. We don't capture them or handle them or ban them. We give them their space to nest and raise their chicks. Each year, we monitor their nesting success, and we work with rock climbers to ensure their continued protection. Here's a timeline of our survey results from 1995 to as of today, 15 nests. Um, and you can see in 1995, there were three nests. And incidentally, around that time, I read an account from a biologist in a report that said that they thought that the carrying capacity in Yosemite was probably about five breeding pairs. So that was an underestimate compared to um, you know, what we are finding today with 15 nests. Um, and we have done con annual monitoring every year since 2009. And over that time, you can pretty much you know, see the increase in the number of nests. This picture of a climber drinking coffee on the same ledge as a peregrine, it was taken not during the breeding season. I think he's maybe winter-ish. <laughs> um, and this is a win-win situation, because these climbers have, climbers have a front row seat, right, to peregrines. They're sharing the same ledge. And when a peregrine can share its breakfast with a climber who's having his coffee on the same, <laughs> same ledge, 
we know we've, we, that, you know, that's what we want to accomplish. Of course, during the breeding season, we close climbing routes that are adjacent to nest sites to give the peregrines their space so that they can raise their young successfully. This figure shows known peregrine territories. The red dot, it's kind of hard to see, but there's red dots in each one of those territories. And, or actually there's not. <laughs> there's red dots in some of these territories. Each one of these polygons is a territory. And um, so the red dots, uh, they represent uh, the active nests just from last year. And, but my point that I'm trying to show here is that they are pretty packed in Yosemite Valley. Um, this is Yosemite Valley here. And then we also are monitoring peregrines at Wawona Dome um, in Wawona, Fairview Dome in Tuolumne, and in the Hetch Hetchy area, there's a territory with uh, three different nest sites, and at Lake Eleanor, um, which we just found out was active today. So we use the information from the surveys to manning to manage the climbing closures accordingly. So in the beginning of the season, on March 1st, we close all of the areas to climbing where peregrines nested the previous two years. And then we start surveys the end of, um, the end of March after they've selected their nest ledge. And then as soon as we find that peregrines are not using a particular nest site, we'll lift those closures. So by mid-April, we've lifted about third, a third of our closures. So it's an adaptive management um, system that seems to work pretty well. And since I've been, um, you know, since we've been doing those consecutive surveys in 2009, I've really watched the trust grow between the climbers in um, the park and implementing those closures because, you know, they've, they've come to learn that we're, we're not doing a blanket closure and we're not closing an area unless there is a bird nesting there. And um, even climbers are speaking out on the importance of protecting peregrines. And here's um, a short video, uh, like a two minute video of that. My favorite formation to climb on in Yosemite is definitely El Cap. It's just so big and so clean and just so inspiring. There's so many routes and there's so much to do. I feel like I see peregrines almost every single time, almost every single day that I'm up on El Cap. To see those birds with their wings tucked back in that dive bomb position and just cutting through the air at unbelievable speeds is, is absolutely amazing. The bird that can go 200 miles per hour was cooler than that. Peregrines love sheer walls and climbers love sheer walls. I'm the field tech who goes out and identifies where the falcons are, what they're doing, and then, you know, from there, implement protection measures. The closures begin with areas where the park and the biologists have seen the birds nesting before. Once they've determined the birds have picked an eyrie in a certain location, they maintain the closures in that area, and then they work to open the areas where the birds haven't chosen to nest. The, the management system here really allows the birds to flourish and it lets the climbers enjoy all the different cliffs that they want to with minimum closures. A lot of effort goes into closing the appropriate amount of routes to protect the nest and no more than that. I think most climbers don't mind following the closures because it's a way more incredible experience to be up there and see these birds flying around and I wouldn't want to jeopardize the ability of those birds to to nest and fledge. <laughs> okay so just to recap a little bit the bighorns are approaching recovery 
The peregrines made it off the endangered species list and are one of only a few species, 1%, that's actually been delisted from being federally endangered. And not too long ago, a new animal just entered the scene, literally. So this fox strolled by one of our motion censored cameras in December of 2014. And as it turns out, this was an extremely rare Sierra Nevada red fox. And this picture was the first confirmed detection of this fox in Yosemite in nearly a century. Prior to that picture, Yosemite's last known Sierra Nevada red fox was documented in 1916 by really different means. Incredibly, the park's chief ranger killed the last known Sierra Nevada red fox. At that time, park rangers were encouraged to kill predators. Um, they were able to sell the pelts and keep the income from that. So what do we know about this fox? We know that um, Sierra Nevada red fox is an endem endemic subspecies to Oregon and California and they're tightly associated with subalpine and alpine habitat. And so as such, historically, they were found through the high elevation range through um, Oregon and the Sierra Nevada. However, in the last century, they've suffered a major range contraction and now occur as only a few highly fragmented small populations. We know less about the status in Oregon, but we do, we are gathering more information um, in Lassen and also in the Sonora Pass area. And hopefully we'll be learning more about Oregon population as well. There's estimated to only be as few as 20 individuals in the Sonora Pass population and in the Lassen population. And those populations are separated by greater than 250 kilometers. Let's see, sorry about that. Okay. Um, and before I zoom into what's going on in Yosemite with Sierra Nevada red fox, I want to kind of provide some background so that you can kind of understand um, what a management conundrum we're in <laughs> on this species. Um, the Sierra Nevada population, um, so, so let's go back to the beginning um, of this timeline in 2010. So in 2010, the Sierra Nevada population was believed to be extirpated from the Sierra Nevada range um, in that, you know, leading up to 2010. And then in 2010, two Forest Service biologists, one of them lives in the area, um, Sherry Licious, who works for BLM. Um, she used to work for Forest Service. And um, let's see. And she got this picture of a Sierra Nevada red fox on the left-hand side. And um, if you don't see a Sierra Nevada red fox in that picture, that is just <laughs> credit to Sherry and her coworker for seeing that ear popping up right there and thinking, you know, we, sh we should look into this a little more. And so I think that what I've heard is that Sherry took the um, bait sock out of the dumpster and um, sent that to the UC Davis lab, genetics lab, um, for genetic analysis of the saliva. And Ben Sachs, the geneticist there, confirmed that it was a native Sierra Nevada red fox. Um, let's see, let me go back for a second. Um, and in the following, so that was huge news because they were thought to be extirpated. And in the following months, the Forest Service in um, UC Davis put up some more cameras and collected more scat and then confirmed at least three to four distinct individuals, suggesting that this was a remnant po population, not just a one-off. In spring of 2011, Kate Quinn, a graduate student from the University of Davis, focused her research on Sierra Nevada red fox. And after um, a couple of years, she was able to document more individuals. However, she documented no reproduction occurring. So she and her advisor, Ben Sachs, hypothesized that inbreeding depression was likely an immediate factor limiting the population, and that that population was a possible candidate for genetic rescue. And in the late spring of 2012, the story suddenly became a lot more complex because two males showed up that 
were not native. They had non-native genes in them. And as it turns out, <laughs> this is like going without me. Um, <laughs> and then a third individual showed up and all three of those were assigned to the Nevada Great Basin um, population. So who are these Great Basin foxes? Well, we know that the ne nearest known population of Great Basin foxes occurs about 200 kilometer kilometers away in central and eastern Nevada. And they probably came from the Rocky Mountain um, subspecies. And, our, and they also had fur farm ancestry in them. So by all accounts, they are not native to the Sierra Nevada, much less to um, this, uh, so they are, they um, are, they, yeah, they came from fur farms. Um, and uh, phenotypically, they, these males that, you know, came in, they have a larger body size. Um, they're found in a wider variety of habitats, so they're not so tied to the alpine, um, including lowland sagebrush, so which is, you know, how they were able to cross from Nevada. So um, immediately after the arrival of the non-natives, we observed numerous litters of offspring with the Great Basin fathers. So sure enough, it appeared that inbreeding depression was a problem for the native individuals and that in a sense, a genetic rescue is occurring from these non-native individuals. So this has biologists wondering if this Great Basin population would have been an appropriate candidate for genetic rescue had we planned it. <laughs> so as you can see, this picture is really complicated. <laughs> so with this very complicated picture unfolding north of Yosemite, we increased our survey efforts in Yosemite. Um, and, uh, and we had this detection December 2014, so that begged the question of, do we have more foxes in the park? If we do, you know, where are they? Where are they found? Um, and what are their genetics? So to answer the question about um, where they are, if we have more Sierra Nevada red fox and where they are, we put up remote cameras. And this is a picture of Yosemite with the Tioga Road down the middle. And since um, we know that there were red foxes up here from um, Kate and Ben's study, then we've definitely populated this area a little heavily with, <laughs> with cameras. Um, and all of our cameras were above 9,000 feet, so trying to get that high suitability habitat um, for foxes. So when conducting surveys for any animal, you need to know what your animal looks like. So this is just a quick tutorial on Sierra Nevada red fox. So red foxes in general, have two distinctive characteristics. The back of their ear is black, and the tip of their tail is white. And they also have a long tail. Um, in contrast to the gray fox and the coyote, which are another two species that we have in Yosemite and in the Sierra, and gray foxes and coyotes have something in common, which is they both have orange on the black of the ear and a black tip to their tail. Um, also, coyotes have a really short tail in relation to their body, whereas foxes have really long tails, long fluffy tails. And then once you've narrowed down your Sierra Nevada red fox with the black on the back of the ear and the white tip tail, you have to be ready for different pelage um, colors. So they can range, um, these are all native Sierra Nevada red foxes, so they can be this um, silver color, silver black, and then this intergrade between orange and black, and then the more um, light orange color. And in addition to the camera surveys, we teamed up with Kate and Ben from UC Davis to do some scat surveys as well. So um, we had a real concerted effort the winter of 2016, 2017. Um, and unfortunately, that winter coincided with record-breaking snowpack. Um, so this is a tough crew <laughs> right there. Um, the crew put on their packs, were ready to go. <laughs> uh, 
Um, and this picture shows a typical camera station with the remote camera right here that is triggered by heat in motion. And then here's a bait sock, so just like a sock from your closet or drawer with um, chicken in it and nailed to a tree. And then these are wire brushes um, that are poking out and that is to, that's our hair snare, so that's to get genetic samples from the hair. And we operated each camera for um, 60 days, at least that was our goal, and checked them every 20 to 30 days. And here's another camera station, and this one is located on a saddle, on a ridge, which is a great place to target for um, Sierra Nevada red fox and other carnivores. And the crew said that this was one of the best field projects they've ever worked on. <laughs> but it wasn't always easy. <laughs> they had to do a lot of digging, in this case, to set up their camp. They had to get creative with getting their water. And they had to lay low for multiple days at a time during snowstorms. And sometimes, <laughs> finding the cameras during camera checks was really challenging and involved a lot of digging. They they dug a lot. <laughs> um, and just as challenging was relocating the cameras after the snow had melted out. <laughs> so here's the camera. It used to be at breast height, which is our protocol. So the snow level was up here. And again, and Dustin, um, he's a good sport, because here he is. <laughs> climbing up the tree <laughs> to get the camera. <laughs> um, and sometimes uh, we would encounter this, where the, tree, the camera was on the <laughs> fallen tree, which would explain when the snow was up here, and they dug and dug and dug, and they just couldn't find what they were looking for. <laughs> so all that work was worth it, because we ended up getting eight different detections at six different locations. And I'm going to do something um, kind of fun right now. I'm going to show you every single picture that's ever been taken of a Sierra Nevada red fox in Yosemite. So here we go. Um, this was the first detection, that one in December 2014 at Bond Pass. So up in the really northern part of the park. This is the second one, also at Bond Pass. This is the third one, also at Bond Pass. So um, these could be the same individuals, could be different. This one's at Shepherd Lake over here. So midway between Bond Pass and Tioga Road. And this one is at Sorian Lake. And Soldier Lake. This one's super curious, but really apprehensive. <laughs> and this one was at Dorothy Lake, up near Bond Pass. And this was our last detection at Roosevelt Lake, which was our most southern detection near Tiger Road, or closer to Tiger Road. And so we ended up with eight detections from six locations. And um, if you were to drop a polygon around their home ranges, it could be as many as three different individuals. And all of those symbols on the map indicate a camera effort. And then we also collected the scat. So we collected um, 184 scat. And of those, seven were identified to be Sierra Nevada red fox scat. And, um, of four different individuals. And we also collected other scats too because we are interested in other carnivores that are up there. So um, what did we find out? To summarize, um, Sierra Nevada red fox inhabits Yosemite in really small numbers. Um, the detections range from the northern boundary south to within 10 kilometers of Tauga Road. And when we um, did the genetic sampling, we were able to confirm those um, those camera detections. And we have um, 
reinvigorated at Sierra Nevada Red Fox Working Group. We just had a workshop and we're working on a conservation strategy to guide future research and management actions, including, you know, all up and down the range, including with Oregon as well. Um, and so next steps um, is to analyze this eight years of data that all these different agencies have collected all throughout the range. And we want to understand what the Sierra Nevada Red Fox's habitat associations are so that we can model what their range um, is and could be. And also we want to continue the SCAT surveys in areas where we know there's um, Red Fox already. Um, so that we can learn more about their genetics. And then camera surveys south of the Tioga Road, where we haven't surveyed yet. Um, we, we were kind of lukewarm on this because it was such a hard field effort, 2016, 2017. <laughs> we were like, the last thing we want to do is put a whole bunch of cameras out. But then um, California Department of Fish and Wildlife um, got a picture of a Sierra Nevada, or a, I should say a red fox, um, up between um, Bishop and Mammoth. At over 11,000 feet, right, Brian? Um, and so we were like, oh, okay, we better survey the south of Yosemite because you just never know. <laughs> so um, I'm wrapping up here. We return the Sierra Nevada bighorn sheep and the peregrine falcon home to Yosemite National Park. And kind of like what I said in that video, we may be capable of making big mistakes, but we're also capable of going to extreme efforts to reverse those mistakes. We're saving two species from the brink of extinction, and now we're learning as much as we can about the Sierra Nevada red fox. We are undertaking a bold journey with these animals fraught with uncertainty, but our hard work is worth it. The next generation needs wild animals and wild places just as much as you and me. And with that, I just want to acknowledge um, some of my coworkers, Stephanie, Breezy, and then Crystal, who's returned for 10 consecutive years to work on the Peregrine Project. And um, this slide just doesn't do it justice when it comes to acknowledgments. Um, I do want to call out a couple of people. Um, John Wayhausen and Tom Stevenson on the Bighorn Sheep Project have been my mentors. Um, they've taught me everything I know about Bighorn Sheep. Um, ben Sachs and um, Kate Quinn with Sierra Nevada Red Fox have um, been real pioneers in, in you know, the state of knowledge of what we know about Sierra Nevada Red Fox, and they've been incredibly su um, supportive of all the work we've done in Yosemite. And then for peregrines, um, I want to thank somebody who's not with us. His name is Jeff Maurer. He started the um, peregrine program in 2009 and started the adaptive management closure program. Jeff had a climbing accident in August 2009, and his family is supporting the Peregrine work that we're doing, and so literally that work wouldn't be continuing if it wasn't for him. And with that, um, I just want to thank you guys for coming here tonight. It's been a real pleasure, and I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs> Um, okay, in the front. So, um, what's, what can be done, or what do you know about how the red fox is breeding? So the question. Babies. So the question is, um, what do we know, and how can we find out about the Sierra Nevada red fox reproduction now? With um, so, um, we're we're um, Kate is still working on. Um, collecting more genetic samples and tracking that genetically, and that's why we want to do genetic work. Um, we were planning our genetic work, we're planning on using scat dogs and doing them because they are more um, effective, and um, that way we can track that reproduction and, um, and the genetics through time, because that's a huge question is, um, was that a genetic rescue and it's a fix? <laughs> Are we comfortable with that? <laughs> um, one thing I forgot to mention is that this is a subspecies that's up, to, up for consideration of endangered, threatened and endangered status under um, the Endangered Species Act. So Fish and Wildlife Service is considering it right now. And this is complicated, it's a complicated picture. So, and question? Those pictures at night, is that with a flash? Yeah, it's an infrared camera, so it oh, it, it doesn't bother them. 
Yeah, exactly. It doesn't, yeah, so it doesn't flash. Yeah. Yeah. The DDT is in the eggs, and you get the peregrine hatch. Is it affected by that DDT problem? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I don't have a good answer for that, but I would imagine that it must not be high enough. It doesn't seem like the biologist would have released, would have taken them back to the nest, does it? Yeah. So I would think, I would probably think not. And that was probably one of the reasons why the peregrines responded to that, to the captive breeding so well. I, I, my ornithology teacher, um, a long time ago, he was embroiled in all of this when they were just trying to decide what to do, take all the peregrines into captivity or leave some out. And apparently it was really controversial during that time. So, but I think, I think that ended up working pretty well. Yeah. So it sounds like when they released the big horn sheep, they released the ewes separate from the studs. Yeah. Yeah, um, so they released the ewes all together because they wanted them to herd together um, since they wanted to you know, stick together in a herd. And, with the ra and they were all from the Langley herd, and they wanted to take the rams from somewhere different because they want the genetics to be you know, as much diversity in the genetics as possible when the rams breed with the ewes. So the rams came from Wheeler and Baxter, and so that was another effort on, another, on a couple days later. And then with the rams, yeah, you can just release them. Um, they wanted to bring them over more quickly with just hanging from the helicopter <laughs> um, instead of in the boxes. Um, so they were able to bring them over a couple days later and release them. But was there a reason that they weren't released together? I think it was because of effort. They, it took all day to get all the ewes from Langley. And so then, you know, the next day they had to go to Wheeler and Baxter. So it was a pretty... I think a lot of moving parts and pe yeah, so moving pieces, so it worked better to s space that out. It was complicated. Yeah, it was. <laughs> Question. Going back to red foxes again for a minute, um, acknowledging the general invigorating effects of immigrants, uh, that notwithstanding, uh, you're still in single digit populations, and you'd expect the genetic fitness to continue to fall. Yeah, um, so this is a big topic <laughs> of discussion. Um, there's a lot of discussion if we can move, um, if we can augment that population with other native Sierra Nevada red foxes from, um, from the Lassen area or from Oregon. And then if, if there's too few in those populations, which it seems like there are, then you know, what does it look like in Washington? Um, so these are all ideas that are out on the table and are being considered. We're <laughs> it's this um, balance of being bold and wanting to, you know, act before it's too late, but at the same time, not making a, you know, trying to use a little bit of humility and not, um, you know, like you said, it might be premature to do that. And so we want to, yeah, we want to explore make sure we're not making a mistake, but at the same time, not, um, not use too much time. And, and just following on to that, is captive propagation a possibility at all? Uh, my understanding that the, the wisdom going back 10 or 15 years, and it may still be the case, is that if you rapidly expand a population that's experienced a bottleneck, you can rescue a lot of the allelic diversity. Yeah. It is something, it's something that's being considered um, as, you know, if there aren't available donor animals in um, California, then Oregon, then Washington, then yeah, that is, that is on the table. That's another option. Because you're right, right now it seems like there's a genetic rescue occurring, but these are, there's not very many animals. And reproduction, even though it's occurring now where it didn't before, um, we don't know what's going to happen in the future. So we're going to monitor that really closely before we make the decision on how to, if we augment or not. 
it's a, it's a complicated situation. I even wondered if I should go into how complicated it is with, you know, with you all tonight, and I haven't in my previous talks. Um, so I thought I'd just go there because we have these success stories and we're learning from all these mistakes and trying to make the right decisions. And here we are, you know, we're in this new situation where the answer is not clear. And um, so hopefully this is another success story, but it's too soon to know yet. Yeah, question. So the red box wasn't, you didn't reintroduce it, it reintroduced itself? Or? Yeah, so far with the Sierra Nevada red fox, we have not moved any animals around. That's right. It's really, really small populations. Historically, they were probably small populations as well, but not this small. <laughs> not like 20 individuals. Yeah, question. This is total speculation, but does anybody have any idea why the ones from Nevada wanted to travel so far? And go in the mountains? Is there deadly creatures? <laughs> the dates in Nevada. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will just say that there, I'm not discounting the possibility that, no one's discounting the possibility that somebody Release is releasing these animals. Okay. Um, those two males um, from earlier, uh, they, were, they showed up around the same time. Mm -hmm. That being said, animals do show up in weird places on their own. Mm -hmm. So we got to see, I think it was seven or eight of them. What herd would that have been? In McGee, Brian, you want to? Yeah. Okay. That was a real treat. That is a treat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you, Sarah. That was really interesting. Please join me in thank you, Sarah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and I'm sure if you have any questions, you can come on up after the seminar, but thank you all for coming tonight. Yeah, thanks everyone. <laughs>